Greetings everyone and welcome to BrickCats. I am very excited to be reviewing Fly in Space's Torment Imperial Star Destroyer today, distributed by Brick Vault. As always, liking this video, subscribing to my channel if you haven't already, or leaving a comment are all great ways to support what I do. And thank you very much in advance for your support, and welcome back if you're already a supporter. The Star Destroyer is probably one of the top three or four most recognizable ships from the Star Wars universe, and even the original trilogy have a ton of scenes that feature it. Of course, the famous opening sequence with the Devastator chasing the Tantive IV, but also in Empire Strikes Back with the chase to the asteroid field, and then the Imperial fleet at the Battle of Endor in Return of the Jedi. Without any substitutions for this model, I was getting 6 stores and $369 before shipping and tax, or about $430 including shipping and tax. Instructions are available for $32.99 from Brick Vault. In my reviews, I offer my opinions on aesthetics and model features, parts issues you might want to look out for, the build experience, the model's integrity, and last but not least, I offer my closing thoughts on the model. If you're watching this review, I assume you've bought the instructions or are interested in buying them. I also assume a basic level of familiarity with Bricklink's ordering system and LEGO nomenclature. My disclaimer on this and all my mock reviews is that I only use genuine LEGO bricks, and I always purchase the instructions. I create these reviews for my own personal enjoyment, and in the hopes that my experience will make yours more enjoyable and or less expensive. And I'm an admin note, since this is my floor setup, it's a little hard for me to manipulate the model. Uh, the model itself is pretty big in general, and slightly unwieldy. So I am a little limited in the camera angles I can get uh, using my camera stand here, but I will do my best to make this as interesting as possible. And also since I'm on the floor, uh, one of the Brick Cats loves the camera, so Maybe you'll see her a little bit more. The Torment looks incredible in person, and the groovling is so good that you've always got something to focus in on and think about. The model itself is 24.75 inches long, 15 inches wide, and is roughly 9.5 inches tall. As you can see from the screenshot and the uh, previous interruption, it's roughly the size of an 11 pound cat in terms of length and width. The stand is non-removable, but I suppose in theory you could change out the lift arms in the stand to make it sit higher or lower. Starting at the very front of the model, the four main hull plates, that's one on each side, top and bottom, they come together really nicely here at the front. On mine, there's a little bit of separation and unevenness just because I've had this assembled for a while and I think some of the uh, connections might have sagged a little bit. These pull plates are quite large and especially towards the front, they're not supported um, up here but more back this way. But when I first assembled it, it was, it was much tighter and it's still very impressive. You'll also notice that Fly in Space managed to get this center gap to be pretty minimal. It is still there. Um, but the gap is smaller than the UCS Star Destroyer, and this is even more impressive since this is in such a, a smaller package than the UCS model. There are some spots in the center gap that you could, in theory, see through. Um, at certain very, very limited angles, um, if I look at it from top down, it's really hard to actually get the angle. But you can see through it, but this is almost never going to be an issue. The main hull plates, and basically what I mean by that is this is all one big assembly. It's a nice mix of studs and tiles, and this applies both to the top and bottom. The top has more wedges and therefore more studs, as the designer has incorporated these raised areas perfectly. And scattered throughout, there's just the slightest bit of asymmetry by design, which in my opinion really adds to the visual depth of the model. After all, these massive ships, these were massive ships, and it, some things make sense to mirror exactly on each side, and other functional areas might not. And one of the best examples I have of that, if I can get the camera angle right here, you can see this section is almost exactly 
I guess that's trapezoidal, whereas this one over here on the opposite side, um, it's not quite, it's just off by a 2x3 tile there. Along the sides of the model, you've got a one plate wide Grebling strip that runs the entire length. And it's built in different sections, so it's not one continuous assembly, but uh, this is done, I think, incredibly well. The angles are a bit tight, and you can see here, uh, let's see, right here, I wasn't quite able to match the Grieveling strip with the edge created by the wedges. And so I don't think that's exactly how it should be, but you get the idea. You do see a fair amount of anti-studs along the bottom edge here. It's pretty unavoidable just because of the wedge inventory and how they're worked out, but I actually think that this kind of serves as more Grebling in itself, and it kind of adds to the overall texture of, uh, I guess it's the trench, if you will, or the, the side strip there. Also noteworthy are the inclusion of the little cutouts on the side of the ship. Um, I don't think these angles are quite right, especially this one and that one. I think they should be more um, angled towards the front, but with the wedge inventory and the way that LEGO wedges work, I don't think that's strictly possible. The turbo lasers flank the ziggurat structure, and these binocular pieces work okay. I think the cannons should be slightly larger uh, than these elements, but I also really like the inclusion of this little gap here, which helps define the, the shape of this section of the ship. And depending on which model you look at, there should be a raised section on the other side, but I think it's reasonable to leave that out. On the ziggurat structure, Flying Space uses a different style of greebling that is also highly effective. And the impressive part here is that these sections along the side here, they actually extend like two or three plates back into, into this assembly. And this is all just one big construction that you kind of plop down in place. It's kind of cool how that fits. And you can see with these two slope pieces at the front here, um, just how well the angle works and, and how tight all of this is. The command tower is complete with the two shield generators, and there are some great angles created by the hinge bricks and these old fingered hinges. And on the opposite side, some wedge plates seal off the back there. The spine of the command tower makes some good use of anti-studs, and here on the back you can see that the grooveling continues as well. At the rear of the ship, the main events are of course the engines, and these barrel pieces are pretty much the perfect shape and size to represent the engines at this scale. Pretty much the only criticism I can come up with about this model is that I think the engines in particular were a missed opportunity to add some color to the model. Some white dishes backing trans light blue would have been a really nice way to simulate the engine glow inside the barrel pieces. And while I don't think you can put anything inside the hemisphere pieces because this is not a system connection, those engines are shown off just as much as they're shown, shown on in Canon, so maybe not a big deal to leave those empty. On the underside, the, both hangers are included, both the main hanger and the forward hanger, as well as the large shield generator bump right behind the stand here. And the stand itself looks really good. Um, all black, and generally does a pretty good job holding the model very stable. And lastly, before I wrap up, I think another thing that would have been interesting to see, just because I feel like it's kind of tradition at this point, is a in-scale Rebel Blockade Runner. And this is not included in the instructions, of course. Um, according to my calculations, a in-scale Blockade Runner would be just a shade under seven and a half studs long. So here is my attempt to do that. This is a 1x8 plate, and you can see I think I pretty much got it almost exactly right, so I was pretty happy with that. And so we can just pop this somewhere, like so, and there you go. And I did test this. Um, I'll throw up a picture of the underside. Um, and I did try and stuff this in into the hangar bay, which is also excellent. Uh, and it does fit just about perfectly. 
This model requires 189 elements and 3019 pieces. While the exterior is all light bluish gray, I was pretty happy to find that there are a number of pieces for which substitutions were possible, mostly on the inside. Both of the Technic lift arm bent 5-3 in black, part 32526, and all four of the Technic lift arm 7L, part 32524, also in black, are used to secure the two main beams, I'll call them, that form the spine of the ship. These are completely hidden and can be any color. And basically, there are kind of two, two parts of the, the ship that come together in like a little V shape, like right about there and these lift arms are used to secure the angle on either side. You will need to increase the quantity of the plate round 1x1 one one with open stud, part 85861 from 4 to 6, and you'll need to decrease the plate modified 1x2 one with 1 stud with groove and bottom stud holder, part 15573 in light bluish gray from 55 to 53, and I will get to that, get to why later. There are three antenna bases specified in light bluish gray, part 4592, but this is one of those situations where the element alone is usually not listed as often as the combined part number in BrickLink. So I recommend substituting part 4592C02, that's the antenna small base with black lever in light bluish gray, as this usually reduces your store count. BrickLink sellers are, tend to list the common part combinations, like another good example are the hinge plates. Um, as the combined element instead of just separating the base from the lever in this case. The following pieces form the forward part of the frame and lie just below the bow of the ship right about here. These are hidden and can be any color. There were a good number of large plates and wedges for the large hull sections on both the top and bottom that make up the wedge shape and these are also completely hidden and can be any color. The four Technic Brick 1x14 in dark bluish gray, part 32018, and the two Technic Brick 1x10 in light bluish gray, part 2730, these form kind of the frame of the wedge shape, they're right about here. And these aren't completely hidden, but they're set so far back, like even if you look edge on onto the Griebling, it's really hard to see um, and if you sh shone a flashlight, shine a flashlight back there, and it was kind of some crazy color, you might be able to see it. But in my opinion, this is a risk worth taking if it saves you a couple dollars. So any neutral color is definitely safe, but in my opinion, even an off color would be perfectly fine. The following list of pieces are kind of in multiple locations, so I'm not going to take the time to point them out individually, but I did list the step number next to the elements that you need to keep a portion of them in the specified color. So basically, for example, uh, the minifigure neck bracket, six of them uh, don't have to be light bluish gray, and the six that don't have to be light bluish gray are in steps 48 and 49. The model calls for the old style fingered hinges to each, the hinge plate 1x2 with two fingers and hinge plate 1x2 with three fingers, part 4275 and 4276 in light gray. These are probably going to be your most expensive pieces, but they do need to be in light gray as they're right on the bridge here, very visible. Um, and these are pretty much the only pieces that are not in light bluish gray, because they're not made in light bluish gray, on the exterior of the model. And lastly, this should come as no surprise, but the model requires a number of elements in large quantities that will almost certainly be cheaper ordering directly from Pick a Brick. Instructions for the tournament contain 1054 steps, and each part or subassembly you add in a given step is outlined in teal. Overall, the instructions are excellent. Each step has you adding a reasonable number of pieces, and the build generally goes at a comfortable pace. The best part about these instructions is that the trickier connections, the, or well, the steps with trickier connections, are very well supplemented with notes and actual photos, and the designer takes additional time to highlight some reference points to make sure you got things at just the right angle or the right orientation. 
And I found these extremely helpful in certain steps as, a major, as the major parts of the model only fit together if you've got these angles or the spacing just, just right. One thing I did find over the course of building this model is that adding the second half, after adding the second half of the top hull section in six, uh, step 660, this is the last hull section, so you're basically left with just the big triangle. Um, the model is very front heavy at this point, and it tends to tilt forward, so you're likely going to need to extend the base a little bit or make a temporary support structure at the front. I just use like a, a column of one, uh, two by two bricks to keep this from tipping over and you can leave it comfortably on your desk with the support there. And this is counterbalanced by the ziggurat structure once you get that on and construction of that starts pretty soon after. But in the meantime, it just uh, is really nice to not have to worry about the whole thing toppling forward. I only ran into viewing angle problems in two steps that are mirrors of each other, steps 368 and 446. This step has you installing five turntable plates, but I can only see three clearly, and if you look hard you can see the smallest edge of the fourth one. It's not hard to figure out or make a reasonable guess where the last one or two could go, so this isn't a huge deal, and this is just at the very front of the top section there. The only real problem I ran into was in steps 752 and 866. The assembly as shown will not connect due to this extra jumper plate sticking out the back. This needs to be replaced with a 1x1 round plate with open stud in steps 744 and 858. I messaged Fly in Space about this on Instagram and he was kind enough to confirm that this was an artifact from the earlier version of the build. I was really impressed with a couple of the connections, especially when connecting the hull assemblies to the frame, and there's some great use of turntables here, especially on the bottom. The ziggurat structure is really neat how it just drops into place, and there are some other spots throughout the build that are just really novel, and most importantly, they're, they're actually quite secure. Off the top of my head, I can't recall any connections that would be considered illegal, and while some are certainly more fragile than others, the designer did not resort to any questionable methods even when creating the more complicated shapes. With the standard BrickCast disclaimer that I didn't do all of this in one sitting, I believe this model took around 12 hours to build start to finish. Some of the larger groups of pieces were very handy to have separate, and in this case I did sort out the larger quantities of tiles and plates and such into their own little baggies. And this was especially useful when building the hull assemblies as you're using a lot of those tiles in um, a number of different cons basically consecutive steps. This model doesn't have any real play features, and it's clearly designed to sit on display. That said, I was pleasantly surprised at how solid most of the model is. You aren't going to be handling it much, but carefully moving it around isn't going to be a problem for the most part, and most of the pieces will stay in place. You are going to want to be careful a little bit around the front here. You've probably seen this pop off a couple times. Uh, this connection is a little bit loose. And similarly, some of the connections around the engines, especially these hemisphere pieces, are a little less secure than others, so you want to watch out for those. It's also fairly easy to knock these grieving strips out of alignment. Uh, I can show you that you can tell this is just one long section, and at any of these pivot points with the bar with clip, like right here and right here, if that bends out of alignment, it's actually pretty hard to bend so it gets back in line with the, the wedges here. So just be careful of that, and I find this happens most often when, when either this plate comes off or this plate comes off, and you need to kind of rejiggle things to get it back into the right shape. The stand, of course, is integrated, and while I do find it stable enough since it only has a single connection point, it does flex up from side to side pretty easily on that. And see it kind of wiggle back and forth. This is noted in Brick Vault's video, and I do kind of wonder if this flex enough would the four pins holding this together inside pop out, and that would be a really bad day, but I would be a little circumspect in testing the limits of that, but in general I don't think it's going to be a problem. Another thing about the stand, I think I extended this for the 
problem I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a little bit nerve-wracking, but it'll be okay, I think. Ooh. Anyway, this connection kind of pops off every once in a while. It's not the most sturdy. It's just a stick connection. And same thing with these slope pieces at the back here. Those tend to come off. So, not a big deal. These are just going to sit on your shelf, but just be aware that, especially when you're trying to pick this up, since the only way you can really pick it up is by the stand, my, my hands tend to bump those and they come off. It's actually kind of difficult to give you a good idea of just how impressive this model is in person. The Torment is pretty much the perfect display star destroyer, and Brick Vault's video has some comparison pictures where you can see how accurate the shape of the model is compared to the film models. It's in a much more displayable size than the UCS star destroyer, and the level of detail makes this my favorite model I've built to date. In terms of cost, without any substitutions or using without using pick a brick, Bricklink was returning six stores and three hundred sixty nine dollars before shipping and tax, or about four hundred thirty dollars including shipping and tax. Setting the color of the pieces in the part section to not applicable, which means that it can be any color, this reduces the Bricklink only cost to six stores and three hundred forty one dollars before shipping and tax, or about four hundred one dollars with shipping and tax. Buying the pieces I recommend from Pick a Brick and Bricklinking the rest resulted in a $151 purchase from LEGO. Shipping and handling were free as I met the $14 threshold for both bestseller and standard items to eliminate the handling fee, and I got free shipping by spending over $35 total. Buying the remaining pieces from Bricklink, I was getting 4 stores and $174 without shipping and tax, or about $210 with shipping and tax. The combined total was therefore $351. I have a feeling you can get this lower as not many of the elements are completely unavailable from LEGO. So since you're purchasing uh, from LEGO anyway, it's probably worth your time to go through each Bricklink cart and see if the most expensive pieces from each seller can be bought from Pick a Brick instead. Instructions for the Torment cost $32.99 which seems a little steep to me, but compared to the overall cost of the model, it's fairly in line with what I expect from a mock. You can use some of the discount codes that are floating around out there to bring it down a little bit, or occasionally Brick Vault runs sales around Black Friday or May 4th. So if you get these instructions on sale, I think it's an even better deal. A link to the instructions will be in the description, as well as a link to Flick Fly in Space's Flickr page. Thanks as always for watching my review of Fly in Space's Torment Star Destroyer model. If you built the Torment, you have something to share that I left out, or have a question about something I didn't cover, please leave them below in the comments. If you're wondering, yes, I've also got the negotiator parts collected for a future review. Remember to leave the video a like, subscribe to the channel, or follow me on Instagram if you haven't already, and I hope to see you back next time.